morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. Here we are again with uh, Tom Clement. It's been a while, Tom. It has. It, felt, it feels like it's been a year. But you've been, <laughs> but you've been doing good things while you're gone, and I think I have been too. We've been both busy, busy, busy. So, um, welcome back to Entrepreneurva uh, in our in our webcast, our founder webcast. And today we are going to be discussing something that um, is really taking more of a spotlight and that's founder mental health sort of entrepreneurial mental health um i think about like where i'm at and and where inga's at we're in the northern hemisphere and we've got winter uh upon us basically um and that's that's a particularly tough time sometimes for folks uh with mental health uh struggles and so we thought this would be a timely topic to go ahead and, and, and get into. So why don't we start with some introductions, Inga? You want to go ahead? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So um, uh, my name is Inga de Dreu. Uh, I've been working with entrepreneurship uh, for over 10 years, mostly in Colombia, where I've lived for quite a bit. And um, I have, uh, from that experience, I've developed a playground for entrepreneurs, which is a serious game. Uh, used by coaches, entrepreneurship coaches and educators in class and also with their entrepreneurs in an incubator type of setting. And uh, that's been really fun building the community. So your introduction. Tom. Yep, I am Tom Clement and I am an assistant professor of management and entrepreneurship at Minnesota State University in Mankato. And I have been teaching now, this is my 21st year, and it's been primarily in the area of entrepreneurship education. Um, so I've seen a lot of different changes over the last 21 years. And it's that's why it's fun to do this webcast and be able to sort of talk about some of the changes I've seen and some of the things that I've uh, experienced uh, and, and relative to all the entrepreneurial experiences I've had outside of education as well. So I'm always involved in something, something business oriented uh, outside of school as well. So Inga, why don't you start us off with some of your perspectives on on mm -hmm. sort of the, the mental mm -hmm. health side of things? Yes, let me first um, um, say that uh, you're welcome to introduce yourself in the chat, of course. We yes. love to hear from you. And I see that Alexandra uh, has already um, has already typed in a comment. Excited to join. Thanks for organizing and bringing awareness to mental health. Yeah, we thought that indeed it was very timely. There are so many things going on in in the in terms of mental health for founders. So uh, good to see you, Alexandra. And of course, everybody who's in the audience, please uh, write your comment, introduce yourself, or any question or or comment that you would like to share, so we can make the session interactive and um, as engaging as, as possible with your questions and your comments. So yeah, founder mental health entrepreneurship is um, a very particular set of circumstances that one can find themselves in. Uh, and therefore it kind of, a, it's both uh, attracts people who are different, who feel different. And it also generates a situation that's very different from a standard kind of job type of environment. So uh, responsibility and accountability is all on the entrepreneur usually. There's a lot of tasks around. Sometimes you can kind of delegate if you have a team, but sometimes you don't. And in the end, you're responsible for everything. Um, it's a long-term thing. It's not going to be over in a couple of weeks. If it would be over in a couple of weeks, you can kind of go ahead first and, and just go for it. But the thing is that in the end, you need your sleep, right? And you need kind of a balance. If you have a family, you need to dedicate time to that as well. So entrepreneurship in the end requires a very different set of skills and a very different set of responsibilities and therefore can generate a lot of stress and that leads to a lot of uh, um, issues in, in terms of founder mental health. And I think, you know, I ran into a term, you and I were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, neurodiversity, where there's been a lot of, a lot of research done on entrepreneurs and they, they've realized that there's a lot of folks that um, have some mental health 
I don't know if I would say issues, but just some mental health uniquities about them that tend to gravitate more towards entrepreneurship. We see a lot of ADD, ADHD, different things like that uh, among founders. And there's even folks uh, that have been uh, determined to be on the spectrum, the autism spectrum. And one of the reasons why individuals with some of those, uh, you know, unique situations tend to gravitate towards entrepreneurship, as you said, is because of that ability to sort of do things on your own. Yeah. Uh, but I know one of the struggles that I, that I've seen and I've experienced myself when I was in business is a lot of the isolation that goes with being an entrepreneur. And I think one of the reasons we've seen such a, 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 a big spotlight put on mental health now with founders is because of the pandemic for all the bad things that came out of the pandemic. One of the good things that we've realized is that isolation is not, <clears throat> not healthy. Um, and it's not good for people. And even when we have a pair, for example, if you have a couple, whether you're married or partners living together or, or you know, whatever the situation is, isolating together doesn't make it any better. Um, and that's one of the things that I experience as an entrepreneur, and I'm sure you have as well, Inga, where you sort of bury yourself in the startup. Yes. You have issues and things that you need to figure out and you just think that the deeper you dig yourself into that, you know, you find yourself in your office at two o'clock in the morning trying to figure things out with your business, whether it's, you know, you're not making cash flow or you're trying to figure out your advertising or whatever it might be. Um, and that can be really, really hard on people. There's not a lot of people, even people that would consider themselves a loner or an introvert, isolation is still not healthy for people. And it's probably one of the leading issues that entrepreneurs face uh, just in general, you know, and there's other things you talk, you talk about like anxiety and whatnot, yes. given stressful situations, but the isolation is probably one of the biggest things that I see. Uh, but yeah. again, people with certain mental health um, characteristics tend to gravitate towards entrepreneurship because of the ability to isolate a little bit more and do things on your own without having to rely on someone else. But that can also be a double edged sword. Um, and sort of work both ways. Definitely, because you, 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 if you're working in a company, you need to go to your work usually. You need to connect with people. You need to continuously have well meetings or just your work day and be there at the office or wherever you're working. Um, as an entrepreneur, you can decide for yourself. And if you want to stay, um, uh, you want to put your desk in your bedroom, you basically don't need to leave your bedroom even right. so that's that's the isolation and the thing is that i think that's the root cause for many of the of the burnout uh, depression and a lot of things that uh, can undermine founder mental health the thing is that uh, for different people um, there's different solutions right so you've already mentioned autism you've already mentioned introversion uh, entrepreneurs tend to be kind of on the extremes of personality on the extremes of personality skills right there is no typical entrepreneurial personality there's a couple of really extroverts but a couple of really introverts as well usually the combination is quite well um, but uh, the thing is that uh, there's uh, even if you're an introvert, I consider myself an introvert, uh, so not an extreme introvert, but I do consider myself an introvert. I know that I connect better with people when I kind of get to exchange with a small group and I go into depth on right. things. So just taking myself as an example, I need to create that space for myself. Right? I need to create a couple of people who are doing something similar, who are trying something and building something. And with those people, I can really connect and share my journey, right? Which is something that if I share my journey, I share the things that go well, but also the things that go, don't go too well, which is something that you can't really find on a networking event when you need to connect with a lot of people just to... Uh, get the message out there or you need to give a presentation that's also something there might be a lot of social events like presentations that doesn't help for isolation 
right? That can even no. isolate you even more because then you share your story. And yes, there's going to be a lot of people, but it doesn't take away the loneliness in the struggles. Well, and then it heightens another issue that I wanted to discuss briefly today. And that's um, something that's important to uh, me in particular, and that's imposter syndrome. Um, it, it, you know, I never really thought of that as being a mental health uh, problem before, but it really is because it speaks to your confidence, your self-confidence, it speaks to your self-esteem. Um, and, you know, if you come from a background where, for example, I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs dropped out of high school or they didn't get a college degree or they came from very, uh, very simple backgrounds, you know, where they didn't come from a wealthy family or uh, even a family where there was a lot of entrepreneurial experience. You can put yourself in situations where you feel completely out of your league. Um, you know, you show up to, like you said, an event where you have to present uh, maybe it's some sort of networking event or a local chamber of commerce invites you uh, to speak or something like that. And you look around the room and you see all these successful or at least uh, outwardly successful individuals sitting there. It can be extremely intimidating and it can make you feel um, really inadequate in a lot of ways. And I know that I struggled with that. Um, as, as an entrepreneur, but you know what? I also struggle with it as an academic. Um, you know, I, I've never considered myself to be a hardcore academic. I, I'm just a regular person that sort of stumbled into academics and started teaching um, and then went on and got the degrees. But I've always felt sort of inferior in a lot of ways to some of the folks that I work with because I work with some really smart people um, that, that have the, the, just the brain power to be able to do these incredible statistical analyses on things and whatnot. I don't have that necessarily, but what I've learned when I, when I stop and I listen to those folks, I have skills that they don't have, you know, and I have things that I can do that they marvel at, uh, just the same as I marvel at their, you know, maybe their, uh, mathematical skills or whatever. I mean, we all have things that we bring to the table um that you know is is an issue that we have to struggle with and and you know everybody has that and it's very hard to put that in context however when you're sitting there and you know you know uh, nadia points out something she doesn't like to put the word syndrome next to the word imposter you know and that's kind of more of a terminology uh thing um, but it is it's a discomfort and it's part of being it's part of your growth pattern as a as an entrepreneur being able to sort of fight through that um, and realize that you, you bring things to the table that other people might not. Um, and that, that's one of the, the situations that we see a lot. And uh, that's something that as an entrepreneur, you need to do a lot, right? Because there are so many things that in the end you're responsible for, right? And some of them are not your strengths. So you're right. going to be uncomfortable. And the thing is how to get comfortable being uncomfortable and how to kind of guide that stress. And rather than letting it stop you, letting it make you better and not get not getting it out of the way, but learning how to how to really deal with it. And I think it's a process, right? Because in in the beginning, there's going to be a lot of anxiety. And at the start, the thing is that Every obstacle of anxiety is going to look huge, like a giant mountain in front of you and very difficult. But the thing is that as an entrepreneur, if you persist, then you know that there is something behind the mountain, right? So you kind of get over the mountain. You kind of uh, uh, know what to do with yourself and that uh, you don't need to... Um, so. The point is, anxiety is always going to be there. But the thing is that stress in that sense is optional or you can learn how to deal with it and how to channel it. And that way it becomes easier. And stress in the end is, is important because anxiety or new things are always going to be there. Well, and I was lucky because my first real startup was a retail store and it was a bricks and mortar and I physically had some place to go every day. And I think that's important as I look around at more and more entrepreneurs that are running online ventures or they're creating technology solutions. 
Um, you know, maybe they're doing a, like a drop shipping type of business or whatever, where they're basically, again, getting back to the isolation uh, discussion, they're basically isolated at home. Uh, they don't get that networking, that social interaction of being able to go to a physical location all the time when they're running their business ventures. So um, again, tying all of that together, my biggest, one of my biggest recommendations is if you are involved as a founder in running one of those online types of ventures or creating technology or, or coding or whatever it is you're doing, try to find a place where you can go to get out, uh, whether it's just a coffee shop or that's one of the beauties of these co-working spaces that we've uh, seen springing up, especially over the last 10 years or so, yeah. uh, where there's opportunities. And there's even some uh, that are hosted by universities, for example, where you can go work for relatively free. Um, you might have to pay just a nominal fee for internet access or whatever, but it gives you that space to be able to get out and be around your peers uh, be around like-minded individuals, and that can be a huge uh, benefit to your mental mental health um, as you as you sort of move forward with with that. Um, and you know, I think that's just such an important thing that we've come up with as we've started to come up with, frankly, more isolated business models. Uh, yeah. Bricks and mortar is still there; it's still important, but it's not as large of an emphasis, especially for younger folks um, that are trying to create these things where they can be more independent. Um, yeah. on their own and not be physically tied to that. I mean, I at least had customers and things and the comings and goings of a bricks and mortar operation to be around. And yet I still found myself very isolated a lot after yeah. hours, you know, after everybody goes home for the day, I'm still there yeah. trying to figure things out. And that was where it got to be really challenging. I actually used to work in an old church. They had repurposed the church and the, yeah. the church part was um, they had a lot of artists um, and then the uh, the house, the house of the priest, the, mm -hmm. uh, what used to be the house of the priest was destined to be like a, a, a um, like this co-working uh, co-working station. So yeah. there was an interesting interaction. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. The thing is that I th also think that um, uh, what we once one of the things that we've learned from COVID is that uh, it's very good to meet once in a while physically, but you don't need to do it all the time. Right. Right. So, uh, for example, with the playgrounds, the community of facilitators is global, so we never really get to meet because it's just impossible sometimes somebody comes to the netherlands and that's great because then we can meet and then we can work and it's always different when you meet somebody really in real in real life but um we can still do lots of things online and it makes things more practical so you can also find these communities online uh, if you don't really feel at home uh, in the physical spaces that you're at Right. Yeah. And, and, you know, I was looking at the chat here and Nigel Adams, uh, one of our great, uh, great followers and, and watchers has, has pointed out that there's a lot more research that's starting to be uh, pursued and done around this neuro neurodiversity discussion, which I find personally interesting. And I don't know where I was that I missed that term over the years, but I just never heard. I'd read research on sort of the different mental health uh uh, you know, concepts that relate to entrepreneurs, but I just never heard the neurodiversity uh, term before. So it'll be really interesting to see some of the studies that are coming down the road. Um, you're able to scroll through the chat and you want to say hello to a few folks? Yes. See if there's yeah. any questions. Um, I, Since you're the host. <laughs> we've addressed a couple and then there's a lot of people saying hi. Yep. And quite a couple of people from Canada joining, which is great. And uh, Hi to Rebecca Corbin. Questions. Said hello to Alexandra and Maria. And Mike Hahn is always with us. He always joins us. You're supposed to be working, Mike, but you're always <laughs> joining us all the time, which is good. And Maria from Futurepreneur. Yeah. John. Asher. 
So I just wanted to get back to, to Nigel's comments because the thing is that in, in the particular circumstances of entrepreneurship, the autonomy and uh, being able to kind of organize yourself for entrepreneurship does attract a lot of people with, with different brains in the end, bra brains who bring something different to the table because then they feel they, uh, they can contribute something in their own way. Um, just before this, uh, we started the live session, we had an interesting comment on that because there's a, a, quite a lot of entrepreneurs who think they need to be kind of the rebel entrepreneur. Uh, right. People who take as example uh, very eccentric personalities who would like to be in the spotlight a lot. Uh, Elon Musk and Steve Jobs and everything who are great entrepreneurs, of course, but they're very much themselves. They're very much their own personalities and the thing is that if entrepreneurs try to copy that then they're not being themselves and it doesn't work because they're just not that personality and that's where it goes wrong and then you get the disconnect and it might lead to loneliness or burnout or whatever the thing is people who are really different whose brain really works in a different way whether it's adhd or um or uh, any type of autism or uh, being dyslexic even that brings something different to the table and if an entrepreneur can really use that diversity to create some circumstances for themselves in which they can thrive that is really powerful and entrepreneurship like no other field that they can move in provides that freedom yes right because they have their own autonomy as long as they can be persistent about what they're trying to achieve be persistent about their entrepreneurial intentions uh, there's a lot that they can do well and if you're um you know it's it's really interesting to think about that sort of the the, the diversity of individuals i used to do an activity with my entrepreneurship students and i would recommend that any coach or teacher in the entrepreneurial space do something similar you can structure it however you want to do it but i used to show my students uh the covers of popular entrepreneurship magazines like entrepreneur and inc and fast company and just show them the cover photos of the individuals that were on the cover of the magazine and then ask them for their impressions of what an entrepreneur looks like or what an entrepreneur should look like um the media puts a real heavy skew on what an entrepreneur should look like. They're either somebody very beautiful, uh, and I say that in sort of a celebrity sort of way, um, or you sort of get this this view of the disheveled hair and the hoodie, you know, the very techie kind of Silicon Valley type of entrepreneur, more of the Steve Jobsy type. And I'm talking back in the the '80s, Steve Jobs, if you will. Um, and that's really a, that's that's really a stereotype. Uh, most, I mean, I, I challenge most people, if you're walking down the street to walk up and tap an entrepreneur on the shoulder, you can't tell an entrepreneur from anyone else in a lot of cases. They're just regular people, um, you know, just like you and I walking down the street. And yet, you know, the media definitely paints a portrait of what an entrepreneur yeah. should look like. Um, yeah. But that also speaks and then to their, their, then it turns into role models and people try to copy and that's not the point of entrepreneurship entrepreneurship should be a way of expressing your unique value to the world right and then scaling that up or bringing it in somehow kind of digesting it into a value proposition and and integrating that and that's something that a lot of people uh, kind of uh, go wrong in from my perspective. And then I want to get to the next point that I'd like to address, which is burnout. Yes. But burnout is a very big issue as well for, for entrepreneurs. Uh, this is like a long-term thing. From my perspective, that disconnect, that having to play a role, that really leads to a type of stress that induces burnout if you can't be yourself if you feel you have to uh, have to play some sort of role whether it's in your job or in your uh, in your role as an entrepreneur uh, that really weighs very heavy on your shoulders 
Now there's a lot of like a, a nine to five uh, talk on LinkedIn. Uh, there's a lot of hustle type of <coughs> talk on LinkedIn. Those are kind of two camps who uh, it's, it's quite a paradox between having to work and dedicate a lot of hours and dedicate a lot of energy. And on the other side, people saying you need mental health, you need to take very long walks every day and go to the spa and everything. Um, the thing is that if I, I do think that if you disconnect from that, and if I've had that experience, sometimes I've been working for 80 hours or 100 hours a week, and it's been no problem. It's It's been great because I've felt very good. And sometimes I was working for 32 hours a week, which is really not a, not a lot, or 24 hours a week. And I really fair, felt burnt out, right? right. I, burning out. So the thing well, is, if you don't yeah. feel yourself, that's when that disconnect comes in. And that leads to burnout more than anything from my perspective. Well, and I think there's a huge difference between a more physical form of entrepreneurship where maybe you're doing a lot more physical activity versus mind work. Because, I mean, I've, I tell my wife all the time that, I mean, I'm, I, I do contracting stuff outside of work on, on the side, and I can go out and do that stuff all day long and not be half as tired as some of the mental work that I perform in the academic space if I'm working on a big research project or something that I really have to immerse my brain in. Um, and I think what's important about what we're discussing here with the burnout is you have to learn to read yourself. You have to learn to be more intelligent about yourself. And that took a long time for me to do that. I don't think I started really doing that until I was in my 40s, really reading my health signals. Uh, we have to become much more attuned and much better at, at sort of reading ourselves. Um, and I think Things are going to get better that way with all the different wearable devices that we have and all the different you know, ability to sort of be able to keep tabs on our health much better. Um, I've read some research over the last five years, for example, that uh, some researchers at MIT are working on some dopamine detectors to try to help us curb our social media use where you can actually put a wearable device on that can sense when your dopamine levels are too high. Um, and we, we can learn to sort of curb our activity. That's exciting stuff to me because I sometimes need that kick in the pants. I'm not always able to self-regulate. Um, I need that that help or that aid uh, to help me stay on task uh, and, and be able to learn more about myself and sort of read my body better. Um, and I think a lot of that comes with both emotional intelligence as well as a little bit of maturity. Uh, yeah. But I think we can speed that maturity up a little bit with some of the devices that we have. Um, we've got about two minutes and I just want to mention one thing real quick, if that's okay. Yes. If you want to read some really interesting information as it relates to mental health, um, there's an individual, Dr. Dean Shepard, who was at uh, university of Indiana for a long time. And now I think he's at Notre Dame. Uh, but he did a really interesting string of research back about 10 or 15 years ago, revolving around the loss of a business, the failure of a business being equated to the grief process. Um, and you don't necessarily have to go immerse yourself in an academic article. He's done some TED talks on this out on YouTube. Um, and basically he talks about the fact that if you look at the struggles that entrepreneurs face when their business fails or when a business goes under, it's very, very similar procedurally to the grief process of losing a loved one. Um, and I think when you bring that up, people sort of roll their eyes and think, you know, how could that possibly be similar, you know, losing a, a, a mother or a father or a brother or sister or whatever versus losing a business. And yes, they're not contextually the same, but when you consider the amount of time and energy and mental fortitude that people dump into a startup and to have that business fail, um, that can be an extremely traumatic experience. Uh, and, and I think the equation between grief and failure, business failure is brilliant. And he just did a bunch of research into this area. And I really think it's interesting reading for anyone uh, to go out and look at that sort of thing and, and realize that, that this is really a process we work through uh, from a mental health perspective if a business fails. And I just wanted to throw that in there real quick. Definitely. Definitely. The thing is that, well, sometimes people say their business is their baby. 
it's so much time and energy and so much passion as well. If that fails, that's definitely a big, a big issue, a big grief issue. Let's go through a couple of the comments. There's been quite a couple. Um, let's see. It takes courage to embrace your authentic self. Yeah, definitely. Especially if you're from a minority group. Yes. yes. Definitely. Yeah, for sure. And and you know, it takes a long time, you know, to to really be comfortable enough in your own skin for a lot of people. That's not true of everybody, but it, it's true of most of us, I think. Um, where you know, depending on the background you come from, and like Nadia mentioned, m minority status and. Uh, people of, of underrepresented populations and whatnot. It takes a long time for you to be able to sort of be comfortable in your skin to the point where you can represent your true self. Um, you know, and that, and that speaks a lot to your mental health capacity as well. Um, that can be a huge factor just beyond the business and beyond all the stresses and the, the risks that you're taking and all of that. You just add that in on top of it. And that, that can be a real, yeah. a real challenge still there's so many minority groups who have very interesting entrepreneurs and entrepreneurial ventures um somehow the resourcefulness and even refugee groups yes uh, somehow the resourcefulness really really helps in that sense uh, when people uh, uh, actually can embrace their uniqueness mm -hmm that's where magic can really happen. Well, and I've spent a little bit of time researching some minority entrepreneurship groups specifically. Yeah. And the one word that always pops into my mind is community. Yeah. They're very much a community and they're very supportive of one another. Um, obviously they want to break outside of that shell of the existing community and go to a wider audience, but I'm really, I'm always impressed and amazed at the, at the loyalty of community that exists um in, in that in that space for sure so yes. looks, like <laughs> looks like we're looks like we're out of time yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're let's just go, go through the final couple of comments yep. um rebecca is mentioning a congress next year to include the topic of founder mental health there's so much work to do still so i think that's a great great idea we still have a long way. At least way we're having the conversation now. At least we're having the conversation. Yeah. And there's a couple of people really focusing on founder mental health yes. uh, in the LinkedIn space, which is great, I think. And neurodiversity as well. There's a couple of organizations and people doing very good work in that sense. Uh, Mike says he has the biggest imposter sy syndrome. He only has an undergraduate degree and this is his third university but he has a great team and he's giving you a compliment there tom <laughs> i appreciate that mike <laughs> um so yeah the investment for women-led entrepreneurs and definitely that's a big big issue um the disconnect Guillermo was making a comment about the disconnects that I was mentioning uh, with the set of values and capabilities is cause of stress and ultimately burnout yeah I think that's that's about it I think we forgot to say hello to Dr. Zuli Jacob too hello Dr. Zuli I saw her down at the bottom of the chat that in the beginning so Excellent. Well, Great. Um, this, this has been a really, this has been another one of those topics where I feel like we could do five more episodes and it wouldn't, wouldn't even scratch the surface because it's such an important topic. But as we said, it's, it's something that I'm so happy now that we're having the conversation because, you know, I think back to my first startup over 20 years ago, almost 25 years ago or so, uh, you didn't talk about things like this. Hmm. You, you just didn't, you didn't admit that you had a, a problem or struggles uh, because that made you, made you appear weak, and it it, it you know it, it really was not a topic that was broached very often, at least not in public. 
uh, yeah. not in front of anyone else. He may have been talking to a therapist or uh, seeking professional help, but that was about the only place those conversations happened. Um, so I'm, I'm so happy that this is on the on the front burner now, at least more so than it was a long time no, ago. In the end, entrepreneurs need to support each other, right? And if we can build community around that, we can break the taboos and we can really work on solutions. And at, well, sometimes the solution just starts with sharing the journey, right? right. And anywhere from, from there is okay, right? So just yeah. sharing and then solutions uh, are a lot easier to find as well. So yeah, it's been a very interesting topic. It's been great sharing today. Uh, so um, for those who are uh, watching still, uh, please follow us on, on LinkedIn for more episodes and more content. And uh, thank you for being our audience today. And to my American friends, happy Thanksgiving next week. Next week is our off week, so we'll be back two weeks from now. And I hope everybody has a good beginning of their holiday season here in the States and uh, wish you the best. Great. Have a good week. Have a good day and see you soon.